Hi, everybody, and welcome back to part two of our series, How God Turns Setbacks into Comebacks. But before we look at God's word, I wanna tell you about two very significant historic uh, milestones that are gonna happen the next two weeks in our church family. Next weekend, August 11 and 12, we're gonna do an all church baptism. That means every campus, it will be baptizing after every service in every location. I'm gonna be baptizing at the Lake Forest campus and one of you is going to be, that weekend, the 50,000th baptism in the history of Saddleback Church. That's never been done by any church in America. We're gonna break a milestone and you could be a part of it. If you haven't been baptized, you need to write baptism on the card this week and turn it in. We'll reserve a place for you to get baptized next weekend. Now, the other thing I wanna tell you about that's gonna happen in a couple of weeks is a result of last week. Last week in part one of this series, over 2,000 of you wrote to me on a card indicating that you either number one, wanted to explore God's calling on your life into full-time Christian service. And over 500 of you said, I, I'm interested in full-time Christian service. Or number two, you said, I wanna learn how to use my business or career as a platform for Jesus. Over 2,000 of you. And if you wanna be a part of that today and you didn't uh, uh, do that earlier, you can write number one or number two on your card. And I'm gonna invite you to meet with me for a special gathering on Thursday, August 16th. Thursday, August 16th at the Lake Forest campus from about seven to 9 p.m. on a gathering I'm calling Marketplace and Ministry, your calling and your vocation and God's will for your life and your work. We're gonna do a q and A. I'm gonna do some teaching. We'll have a panel. You'll hear some testimonies, some opportunities for you to explore either going into full-time Christian service or how to use your business as a platform for Jesus Christ. Now, take out your message notes and on your outline, uh, we're going to look this weekend at how to handle the kind of setbacks that seem irreversible. And on your outline, I begin by defining setback. A setback is a loss of progress, a defeat of a plan, or a reversal of good fortune. In other words, it's anything that sets you back. That's setback. And today we're gonna look at what do you do when your setback seems irreversible? You just think the door is totally closed and it's never opening again. What do you do when your setback appears to be permanent? It looks irreversible. You think, I'm never gonna climb out of this hole. Well, the answer to that question is found in the life of a man in the Bible named Job. Uh, th there's a book by his name almost in the middle of your Bible. If you open your Bible right in the middle, you'll come to Psalms, and the book right before that is Job. It's probably the first book written uh, in the Bible, and it's about a man named Job. Now, in his day, Job was the wealthiest man in the world. He was very powerful, very famous, very important, very influential, but on a single day, he literally lost everything. Every one of his sons and daughters, he had a big family, were murdered by terrorists on a single day. That's enough right there. But then uh, natural disasters wiped out all of his crops and all of his livestock. They all died on a single day. It was a disaster. He lost all of his wealth and he became deathly ill with an incurable and extremely painful disease. Now talk about having a bad day. If you wanna read that story and the story behind it, it's in the book of Job. But everything went wrong in his life. That's a real setback. And it seemed like it was irreversible. Job chapter 30, verse 26 and 27, Job says, I looked for good to come, but evil came instead. And I waited for some light, but darkness fell instead. And the churning inside of me, you know, that upset stomach never stops and waves of misery crash over me. I have no doubt in a crowd this size at Saddleback Church this weekend that some of you are feeling like Job. And yet at the end of the story of the book of Job, he has one of the greatest comebacks in history. He loses it all, health, wealth, family, everything, posterity and prestige, but at the end, he gains it all back in even a greater way. Now, this story is gonna encourage you no matter what kind of setback you're experiencing today. What we're gonna to do is we're gonna look at the five things that Job did 
when everything fell apart in his life. You're going to need this someday if you don't need it right now. So I encourage you to write this down. And to help you remember, um, I, I've created a little acrostic around the word trust, T-R-U-S-T. -S These are the five things that Job did to trust God for a comeback when his setback seemed irreversible. So what do you do? What do you do when you've been devastated by something so big that you think, I'm never getting out of this, I'm never coming back from this? You trust, and you do the five things that Job did. So let's get right into it. The T in our trust acrostic stands for tell God exactly how you feel. That's where you start. When you had a major setback, you start by unloading your emotions on God. The first thing you do when you're in pain, you tell God how you feel. You don't tell him how you think you ought to feel. You don't tell him how you should feel. You don't tell what would be right to feel. You tell him how you actually feel. Did you know that when God listens to you, he wants you to be honest? And, and, and that when you are honest to God about your emotions, that's actually an act of worship? Even when you're disappointed, even when you're expressing frustration, even when you express doubt and fear or anything to God, you say, God, I'm afraid. God, I'm guilty. God, I'm resentful. God, I'm sad. God, life sucks. This is terrible. I can't stand what I'm going through. When you're talking to God, you're still focusing on him, and that's worship. And so you start, no matter what's gone wrong in your life, by telling God exactly how you feel. Now, Notice Job's reaction to the disaster in his life. Uh, Job says this, it says this about Job. Job stood up, he tore his robes in grief. That, by the way, is a, is a Middle Eastern uh, custom. And he shaved his head, that's a Middle Eastern custom. Uh, and then he fell to the ground and he worshiped God. He's acting in total humility and in despair and in doubt and in frustration and anger. Anytime you have a loss in your life, any kind of loss, you're gonna have four emotions. You're gonna have anger, why did this happen to me? You're gonna have grief, what have I lost? You're gonna have shock, what's going on here? Uh, and, and you're gonna and, and you're gonna have uh, questions. Why did this happen? I can't believe this is going on. You're gonna have fear. What's gonna happen next? You know what? You need to express every one of those emotions to God. You need, don't need to hold it in. You don't need to say, uh, you know, God, I'm happy about this. You can say, God, I'm angry. God, I'm fearful. God, I'm frustrated. I'm scared. You tell him exactly how you feel. Let me let you on a little secret. Some of you I've told this to before, but some of this is new for you. God can handle any emotion you've got. And you know why? Because he gave them to you. The only reason you have any feelings, you have any emotions, is because you were made in the image of God. It's what makes you different from animals. And God is an emotional God. The reason you have emotions is because God has emotions. All those emotions came from him, and he can handle them. He can handle your anger. He can handle your doubt. He can handle your fear. He can handle your complaints. All, all of that. In fact, Job was brutally honest with God. In Job chapter 7, verse 11, he says this. I can't be quiet. I'm angry. I have to speak. He's saying, God, I'm ticked off. And if you read the book of Job, you will actually see a progression in his reaction to his giant setback where he literally lost everything, devastated. First, he, he expresses confusion. What's going on in my life? You ever felt like that? Yeah. Then, number two, he starts complaining. Then he starts blaming God for all his pain. And at one point he says, God, you didn't do this right. You handled it wrong. You let all this bad stuff happen to me. And God, I don't like it or like you right now. Well, God can handle that emotion. The right response to loss or to tragedy or to disaster is not to grin and bear it. The right response when, when someone, uh, uh, you know, uh, causes a, a setback in your life, uh, you, God never wants you to fake an emotion. Remember that. God never wants you to fake emotion. He doesn't want you to put on a happy face. That's faking it. Never, never, never. He doesn't want you to fake emotion. He doesn't want you to say pious platitudes, what you think you ought to say to God in prayer. He wants you to honestly tell him how you're struggling. God, I'm grieving right now. God, I'm hurting right now. God, I'm, I'm in a lot of pain. I'm depressed. I'm discouraged. 
I'm having some doubts. You tell it all to God, and God can handle it. I'm just wondering how many of you who are listening to me are parents. Because if you're a parent, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, uh, now, this may have never happened to you, but it certainly has happened to me. Sometimes my children, I know this will shock you, actually question my judgment. <laughs> Sometimes my kids question my judgment. Now, my kids never question that I love them. They know I love them. They've never doubted that. And they don't question that I've been around a lot longer than they have been. I've experienced a whole lot more uh, in life than they have. But sometimes they do question my wisdom, daddy's wisdom. And you know what? I'd rather have an honest conversation with my kids than have them stuff it. I'd rather have my kids say, you know, dad, I think you're way off on this. Uh, why did you do that? I think that was a dumb thing to do. I'd rather have my kids talk to me honestly than to stuff it down. And so would God. Lamentations 2.19 says this, cry out in the night, pour out your heart like water. What's that mean? Spill your guts. Pour out your heart like water in prayer to the Lord. With God, honesty is always the best policy. And at the end of the story, God actually commends and praises and encourages Job because he did this first step in the TRUSD, he told God exactly how I feel. He was honest. Job never stopped trusting God, even when he was angry, even when he was upset, even when he didn't understand it, when he was confused, when he had doubts, even when he thought God had messed it all up. He still kept trusting God, but he was just honest. Now, the Bible gives us a lot of examples of many godly people who expressed their frustration to God. One time there was a guy named Jeremiah, and he gets upset at what God did. He says, God, you have deceived me. He's a prophet. Jeremiah's a prophet. I, he says, I think you've lied to me, God, and things haven't turned out the way you told me they were going to turn out, and I'm mad at you. God allows that in the Bible. Another time there's a woman named Naomi, and things don't go well for her. She says, call me bitter because God has made my life bitter. It's in the Bible. Another time there's a guy named David who says, Lord, I've taken the worst from you and I've taken all that you can give, and I'm fed up, I've had it. And God says, you're a man after my own heart. These people were trusting God to handle their emotions, and Job did that too. Now, although he expressed his fear and his questions and his frustrations and his doubts, he says, I'm still gonna trust you, Lord, even though I don't understand it, uh, and, and I, I'm gonna do exactly what you tell me to do, uh, even though I feel like blowing it all off, but, and I'm going to tell you how I feel because I know you can handle it. You know, there's another guy in the Bible named Habakkuk. I'd like to have that name, Habakkuk. He had the same problem, and Habakkuk wrote a little short book near the end of the Old Testament of the Bible. It's called the book of, you guessed it, Habakkuk. It's only three chapters long, and you can summarize the whole book in one word. Why? Why, God? Why is this happening to me? If you've ever felt that question, why is this happening to me? Why God? Why me? Why now? Then you need to go read the book of Habakkuk. Now, what happened in his lifetime is that Habakkuk saw his nation being overrun by terrorists. That sound familiar? And they were just devastating the country and they were brutal and they were destroying his nation right in front of his eyes. And Habakkuk was really upset about it. And he complains to God. He says, God, I don't know what I'm going to do. And he's asking why. There's another guy who did that named David. David went through a really tough time and he didn't know how to handle it. And here's what he says in Psalm 116, verse 10. In the middle of his setback, his deep despair, David says, I believed, so I said, I'm completely ruined. Now, that sounds like a contradiction. Look at that verse on your outline. David says, I believed, so I said, I'm ruined. What in the world is he talking about? What is he saying? Well, what he's saying is, because I believe in God, I know I can complain to God. You ever thought about this? Who does an atheist complain to? <laughs> Himself? I mean, if you complain to God about your life, it means that you at least believe there's a God. And David says, I believed, so I complained. And I kept on believing, even when I said, I'm completely crushed. There's no contradiction in that. Question, what frustrations 
have you never talked about? Let me ask you that question again. What frustrations have you never talked about? You've never talked to God about it, much less talked to a counselor about it or whatever. That frustration at work, that frustration in your marriage, that frustration with your body, that frustration in a relationship or friendship with your parents, what, that frustration with that wacko relative of yours, <laughs> and, and you're feeling, I don't like this, God, but you've never talked to God about it. God can handle it. The, the, the far, first step to trusting God on the road to come back is to tell him exactly how you feel. That's the T, tell him exactly how I feel. Now, the second way to trust God for a comeback when everything looks fatal, final, and no way out of it is the R in trust that it stands for refuse to become bitter. Refuse to become bitter. Now, it's okay to tell God you're mad or you're sad or you're angry or you're depressed, but you don't let that grief or frustration or worry turn into resentment and bitterness. Because really what bitterness is, is that bitterness is saying, I don't trust you, God. Bitterness is saying, I don't see the big picture. When those flames are coming around my life and I'm getting burned on every side, how could God allow this to happen to me? Bitterness is really saying, God, I don't understand what you're doing. And I'm not just mad, I'm, I'm bitter, I'm resentful. And that is like poison. Now, Job did not get bitter. He saw the big picture. And for some of you today, the first time, you're gonna see the big picture with Job. Uh, you're gonna read Job. Uh, there, there was nothing about marketplace in his life, but you're gonna see the picture, the big picture of that God is still in control. Now in Job 1, he says this, when everything bad happened to him, I came naked from my mother's womb and I shall have nothing when I die. Now, let, let me just pause there. You know, I, I have three kids. I was there when they were all, you know, born. And uh, they did come in with nothing. Uh, they, none of them brought toys. None of them brought a portfolio. Uh, none of them had a briefcase. Uh, and and I, I, so I know nobody comes into this world with something. You come in naked. Uh, and also, I would say that I have done hundreds, maybe thousands of, uh, of funerals and I've never seen a U-Haul parked on a gravesite. So in this passage, you come with nothing, you leave with nothing, that's true. He says, the Lord gave me everything I have and, and he, it's his right to take anything away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And it says in all of this, I want you to underline this, Job did not sin by blaming God. You know, if you were to study the book of Job, you'd find that the main question uh, of the book is, Will you love God and will you trust God no matter what happens? Why do you worship God? Why do you love God? Only when things go good? Or will you love God and serve God no matter what happens? Friends, this is the ultimate test of your faith. Will you worship God even though everything's going wrong in your life? You see, you are not promised a perfect life. This is not heaven, this is earth. And, and so your, your faith will be tested. An untested faith is really no faith at all. A lot of times things happen in your life. In fact, most of the times we don't have an explanation and you're never gonna get an explanation. When bad things happen, uh, there may be times you just have to say, I don't know. I, I don't get the big picture, but I trust that God is good. Life is not always good, but God is always good. And when I'm in the presence of God, in eternity, one day in heaven, then I'm going to fully understand it. Right now, my brain isn't big enough to comprehend it. How do you trust God when your heart is breaking? How do you put your eyes on God when they're filled with tears? Well, the, the antidote to bitterness is not to just say, I don't want to be bitter. The antidote to bitterness is actually praise. It's worship. What is worship? It means focusing on God. Now, if you are sitting here today listening to me talk to you, and maybe you've never even been in church before, maybe this is the first time you're here, there are some things you need to know that uh, we as Christians, no matter what happens in life, are, are thankful for. Job talks about these things in, in his book. 
Here's some facts of life that I know are true no matter what happens to me. Number one, God will never stop loving me. That's a big deal. Number two, God has a plan for my life and your life. Number three, God cares about every detail of my life and your life. Number four, God is in control of things even when I don't understand it. And number five, God will protect me. Those are things that I can build my life on when I don't understand why things are happening in my life. God is here, God is near, God cares, God is powerful, God can change it, God is, has a plan, purpose, and he's gonna use it all for good. You know, earlier I mentioned that guy named Habakkuk. And, and, and I said that in the first, those three chapters of that book, they're all about the question, why? Why God? Well, look at this first on your outline, Habakkuk 3, 17 and 18. Here's what Habakkuk did when he had a setback that looked like was irreversible. He says this, even though the fig leaves have no fruit, and even though no grapes grow on the vine, and even though the olive crop fails, and the fields produce no grain, and even though the sheep all die, and the cattle stalls are empty. What is he saying there? Even though everything in my life is a disaster, he says this, I'll still be joyful and glad because the Lord God is my savior. What are you bitter about today? What is some bitterness that you've allowed to take root in your life? I said it earlier, bitterness is a poison. Bitterness destroys, it will eat you alive. It's like a cancer that will take over your life. When you are bitter, it always hurts you more than it does the person you're bitter at. Problem with bitterness is it doesn't hurt anybody else. It only hurts you. You can be bitter and the person you're bitter at, they don't even know it. They could be out having a party, eat the steak, celebrating, and it's destroying you. Now, if you're gonna break through the setback to a comeback, you gotta tell God exactly how you feel, but then you gotta resist bitterness. And you need to realize two things. First, in an imperfect world, everything has been broken by sin, and there's always gonna be plenty of disappointments to become bitter about. So don't be surprised at that. And Jesus said, in the world, you will have tribulation and trials. But second, you need to remember that both bitterness, listen, both bitterness and happiness are choices. And every moment of your life, you're always choosing one or the other. And if you choose to be bitter, at the same moment, you're choosing to not be happy because you can't have both at the same time in your heart and your mind. So my question is your pastor, someone who loves you is this, which one do you want, happiness or bitterness? Job said, the Lord gave me everything I've ever had and if he allows it to be taken away, I'm still gonna trust him because I wouldn't even exist if it wasn't for God. I refuse to be bitter because of the setback. Now, here's the third step in trusting God. It's T-R-U, this is the U uh, in trust when you wanna have a comeback from a setback that seems irreversible. The, the T in trust, tell God how I feel. The R, refuse to be bitter. And the U in trust, acrostic, stands for unite with other people who will help me focus on God. Unite with people who will help me focus on God. Now I want you to get this, it's very important. For any comeback, you're gonna need other people with faith to back you up. You're gonna need other people in your life who can actually believe God for you when your faith is shaky. This is why you must be in a small group of believers for regular fellowship. It's why I talk about the importance of a small group practically every other week. It's why this church is built on small groups. We have over 7,000 of these small groups. They will be your safety net when your setback happens in your life. And you, you cannot isolate yourself. Now, God never intends for you to go through life on your own. He never intends for you to go through grief or uh, sorrow or tragedy or loss or difficulty or setback by yourself. He made us for each other. He wired human beings to need each other. We're better together. We're better in community. And the first thing God said to man when he created man is it's not good for man to be alone. Now here's the problem. 
when you have a setback or I have a setback, when we're going through pain or suffering or sorrow or sadness or loss, the problem is our natural reaction to pain is to withdraw from others, to pull back. And we want to build a wall around ourselves. We want to build a shell. Uh, we want to put up barriers. We want to keep people at a distance. We don't want anybody uh, close to us when we're in deep, deep pain. And God says, no, 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 no. That's the exact opposite of what you need to do. One of Job's friends gave this wise advice in Job. Notice this on your outline. His name was Elihu. And in Job 36, he says to Job, Job, don't let your anger and the pain that you've endured make you sneer at God. Reputation and riches can't protect you from distress, nor can you find safety in the dark world below. He's talking about the occult. Don't turn to evil as a way of escape. But God's power is unlimited. Others have praised God for what he has done. So join with them. If you're taking notes, I want you to circle the phrase, join with them. He says, other people have praised God, join with them. He said, that's how you're going to make it to the next step. You got to unite with others who are going to support you, encourage you, pray for you, be with you. They'll help you out. Now, where do you find those kind of friends? who will lift you up when you're down? Well, a couple places. First, at weekend worship. It's where you are right now. That's why, I, by the way, for those of you who are watching online, I wanna actually encourage you to come to a church service because there are about a dozen more benefits that you receive by actually going to a church service and participating with other people instead of just watching remotely. You don't get all those benefits just by watching remotely. You, you, he says, join with others in worship. A and then the second place that you find these kind of encouraging people is in a small group Bible study that meets on a weekly basis in a home or an office or a dorm room. A and you need a small group for your setbacks. I could give you dozens of examples from my own personal life about how my small group has helped me through setbacks. Now, Job's friend noticed in that passage, he points out a couple of very important truths in what he says. First, he points out that pain is a great equalizer. In other words, disaster is impartial uh, and, and suffering is random. It hits everybody. When you're in pain, your possessions and your position and your power are worthless. It doesn't matter how much money you've got. If you're going through a marriage crisis, that's tearing your heart up, it still hurts. Reputation and riches, he says, can't protect you from stressful setbacks. They don't help. But then Job's friend gives two pieces of very wise advice. And this is what you need to do when you have a setback that seems, you know, ir ir irreplaceable or, uh, you know, you irretrievable. You can't come back from it. First, he says this. Here's his first advice. Never use evil to escape pain. You know, you don't, don't try to avoid it with, you know, doing drugs or getting drunk or doing something foolish like having an affair. You know, a lot of people become self-destructive when they're in pain. They know it's wrong, but still do it anyway, trying to relieve or escape their pain. The Bible says, you know what? You're only going to make it worse, make the problem worse. So he says, don't run from it doing something stupid. Second, Job's friend says a better alternative is to increase the amount of time you spend hanging out with God's people. He says, join with them. Get with God's people who praise God, who are focusing on God. That's what worship is. And he says, join with them. When you are needing a comeback, don't try to do it on your own. Get with people who are God's people who can build you up, encourage you, help you focus on God. When your heart's breaking, when you're confused, when you're down, when you feel like you're about to lose it all or you have lost it all, don't turn from God, turn to God. If you turn away from God, what's the alternative? Bitterness, despair, hopelessness. First Chronicles 16, 11 says, go to the Lord for help and worship him. That means focus, worship means focus on God's goodness. Life is not always good, I said that, but God is always good. Now, what should you ask for when you're, when you're talking to God about a comeback. 
When you've had a big setback, seems irreversible, like Job, well, you ask God to do a couple things. And they're right here in this passage. You ask him for wisdom, so you can have a clear perspective. Uh, and you ask God for strength, because you're going to need both God's wisdom and God's strength for your comeback. You can't do it on your own. Job 12, verse 13 says this, true wisdom and real power belong to God. From him, we learn how to live and also what to live for. You want to know how to live? You want to know what to live for? You're going to need God's wisdom. Where do you get that from? God. The second thing you ask God for is not just wisdom, but you ask him for strength. First Chronicles 16, 11, there on your outline says this, go to the Lord for help and worship him. Do you know that worshiping God actually relaxes you? Studies have shown it actually slows your heartbeat down, lowers your blood pressure. People who go to church, studies have shown this every week, live longer. Psalm 69, verse 32 says this, those who worship God will be encouraged. Worship makes you wiser. Worship gives you strength. Worship relaxes you from stress. Worship encourages you because you remember that God is bigger than the problem and the setback you're facing. And no TV program can offer that. So, to come back from a setback, especially one that needs to do, you need to do what David did. You, he, he went to church. He went to worship. In Psalm 63, David says this, here I am in the place of worship, eyes open, drinking in your strength and glory. That's what you do in worship. You put your eyes on God, your problem gets smaller, God gets bigger, and you gain strength. You know, same thing happened over in Philippians chapter one in the Bible, verse 19, Paul talks about the benefit of having people pray for you in a small group. And he says this to the Philippian Christians, because you're praying for me and the spirit of Christ is helping me, I know that this trouble will bring my freedom. Circle that word freedom. What is Paul saying here? He's saying that prayer is the path back to your comeback. Prayer is the path back to your comeback. So you want to join a small group where you've got people praying for you when you're going through tough times. Now, you know, here at Saddleback Church in our family, we pray specifically for people in pain in all of our 7,000 plus small groups. Sometimes we like to do it right here on the weekends in all of our campuses together as a large group. And I'd like to do that right now. So what I'd like everybody to do is just bow your head in all of our campuses. If you'd bow your head for a minute, and if you're going through a time of grief, or you're going through a big conflict, or you've had a big loss, or you're feeling lonely, or you're dealing with chronic pain, or whatever stress you might be facing right now, a health setback, a financial setback, or any other kind of setback, I want to lead our entire Saddleback Church family in all of our four different continents to pray together for you right now. And what I want to do as a statement of your faith with our heads bowed, no matter what campus you're at, if you are going through a major problem right now and you need prayer from your church family, I'm going to ask you to right now to just quietly stand with your head bowed, you don't have to say anything, just quietly stand with your head bowed as our entire church family prays together for you. Now, people are standing up in all of our campuses right now. And if you're sitting next to someone who stood up just now, you might wanna just reach over and you know, pat them on the back or grab their hand and squeeze their hand just to say, we're with you, we're a family, we're in this together and we're supporting you. Let's pray together as a church family for all of our brothers and sisters who are standing right now. Heavenly Father, we don't know all the needs that are being represented by those standing, but you do. And just as you care about them, we care about them, our brothers and sisters. So thank you for creating these who are standing right now. Thank you for bringing them to be a part of our church family. We ask for the things that that Job asked for. We're asking you to give these people wisdom in their situations. Give them strength. 
in their setbacks. For those who are in pain right now, give them relief. For those who are having a hard time sleeping because they're worrying, help them to sleep better. Together as a church family, we pray that you would encourage the hearts of our friends and our family members who are standing right now, and we ask your blessing on them. Turn their setbacks into comebacks. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. If you're facing a setback, I'll just say it this way. If you're facing a setback, the path back is to get back to saddle back every week, okay? So you got to join with other people who are going to support you. Now, here's the fourth letter of our trust acrostic, which is the S, and that stands for surrender. Here's the fourth step. I surrender my future to God. This is exactly what Job did in his comeback. Anytime you have a loss, anytime you have a failure or setback, what paralyzes you after that is actually not grief. Grief's a good thing. What paralyzes you is fear. It's fear of the future. And sometimes when you've had a setback, people will give you the wrong advice, and that makes you even more fearful. And sometimes that wrong advice will come from friends that you've trusted or even family members who love you can sometimes give you the wrong advice. In Job's case, he got some bad advice from his wife. And in Job chapter 2, verse 9 and 10, it says this. Job's wife said to Job, are you still trying to maintain your integrity? Why don't you just curse God and die? Just end it. You know, that may be the first recorded instant of encouraging a suicide, but she was dead wrong on that one. Job replies to his wife, you talk like a godless woman. Should we accept only good things from the hand of God and never accept anything bad? So in all of this, Job said nothing wrong. Now notice, Job's response to the problem, the setback in his life, that seems irreversible, is total surrender. He says, I don't like it. I don't understand it. But God, I surrender my future to you after this major loss. In fact, he says in Job 13, 15, one of the most famous verses in the Bible where he says, even if God takes my life, I will still trust him. Though he slay me, I will trust him. That is surrender. That's surrender. No matter what happens in my life, I may not understand it, but I belong to God. And I know those things that are true, that God made me, he loves me, he has his best interest, my best interest in his heart. I know that God is in control. I know that this life is not all there is. I know there's more to life than just here and now. I know that one day I'm gonna eternally be with God in heaven. These are things that give me hope and comfort when I've lost everything. I know God is a good God and I don't understand it and it doesn't look good and it's not good and I'm in a lot of pain. But even if God allows my life to be taken, I'm still gonna trust him because I know the kind of God he is and I know what he's got planned for me in heaven. Friends, that is the ultimate expression of a mature faith. How mature is your faith? Is it like a fair weather faith that you only trust God when things are going good? Or is it a wimpy faith, like a washed out baby diaper faith? Or do you have the mature faith of a man of God or a woman of God? that can handle setbacks? Or do you just flip out and flake out when things go wrong? Do you, by the way, how do you know when you've got a weak faith? Do you know what the sign of a weak faith is? One word, <laughs> worry. Worry is the warning light that your faith is weak. Matthew 6, 32 in the CEV translation says this, people who don't know God are always worrying. When you have a setbacks in your life, listen, you're either gonna worry or you're gonna worship. Worry or worship. And the more you focus your life on God, the less worry you're gonna worry during, uh, the, during the setback. Now I want you to see the fifth and final step. And uh, you've gotta do this if you've had a setback that seems irreversible, okay? Here's the last way that you show your trust in God, that you're relying on him. 
the last T in trust is this. Well, let's re re first review them. Tell God exactly how you feel, that's T. R, refuse to be bitter. U, unite with people who help me focus on God. S, surrender every detail of my future to God. And T is trust Jesus for every detail of my comeback. Trust Jesus for every detail of my comeback. You have to trust Jesus with every detail of your life for him to turn that setback into a comeback. Now, you know, some of you were around when this happened, but many of you were not. Many, many years ago, here in the Saddleback Valley, we had a devastating wildfire uh, that spread all across Saddleback Valley, and many of our members had homes that burned down. And what was puzzling is that most of those homes that burned down actually had fire-resistant roofs. So they thought that they were safe from the fiery embers. You know, when, when there's a fire going on, embers float through the sky and the winds take them. And when those embers land on the roofs, they set the roof on fire and then the house burns down. In this area, many of the roofs uh, were fire-resistant and fire-retardant roofs, but they still burned down. Why? Well, what happened is that many of those hot embers landed in the roof gutters and the roof gutters were filled with dry leaves that had not been cleaned out and had piled up and piled up and piled up for months and months and months. And those leaves ignited instantly and the fire got so hot in those uh, roof gutters that it melted those gutters on those houses and that fell down and burned the entire house down. Now really, that's a parable of life. And as your pastor who loves you and doesn't want to see your life go up in smoke, let me ask you a straightforward question. What's in the gutter of your life that's waiting for just one little spark to burn you down? What's in the gutter of your life that's waiting for just one little spark that will burn you down? On the outside, you may be look, looking like you got it all together like your front yard. It's perfectly manicured. You got great curb appeal in your life. Outwardly, you look great. You look successful. But in the gutter of your life, there's some stuff that's been piling up. And it may be bitterness, and it may be worry, and it may be loneliness or confusion or tension or guilt or fear. But it's just waiting for one of those little embers to ignite, and it could burn you down. Friends, you need to give what's in that gutter, in the gutter of your life, to Jesus Christ right now. And you need to ask him to clean it out. So when the fires and the storms come along, you're not vulnerable. I want you to look at what Jesus promises in John 16, He says, by trusting me, you will be unshakable and assured, deeply at peace, in this world, you will continue to experience difficulties, but take heart because I have conquered the world. That's the promise of Jesus Christ, and that is the path back to your comeback. Now, this is what Job did when he lost everything. He lost his family. He lost his health. He lost all his wealth. He lost his prestige. He lost his power, his influence, but he trusted God, and God engineered the greatest comeback imaginable. Look at the last verse on your outline. It's Job chapter 42, verse 10. The story ends like this. After Job prayed for his friends, why was he doing that? Because he knew God was gonna take care of him, so he's praying for his friends. After Job prayed for his friends, the Lord gave him success again. That's the comeback. In fact, the Lord restored to Job twice as much, double, of everything that he had been blessed with before. That's a comeback. God doubles what he had lost in the setback, in the comeback, because God is a faithful God and Job had trusted God's goodness. Would you like to have double for your trouble? That's what happened to Job. He got double for his trouble. Well, there's only one person who can do that, Jesus Christ. So I wanna lead you in a comeback prayer. 
Would you bow your heads as we close together and all of our campuses and those of you watching online, just bow your head and, and first tell God exactly how you feel about what's going on in your life. Tell him, God, I'm, I'm sad or I'm lonely or I'm mad or I'm frustrated or I'm doubting. Tell God, I, I'm angry. I'm, I, I'm, I'm starting to get resentful. Tell, tell God whatever you're feeling right now. Just do that. Be honest to God about the setback, the problems that you're facing. And with your head still bowed, I want you to now tell God that you're going to refuse to be bitter, that you're going to be better, not bitter, and that you're going to trust God for the things that you don't understand that have happened in your life. Say, God, I know that was not good, but you're good, and I'm going to trust your goodness even in, in the bad that's happened. Just do that. Now, now tell God that you're going to get serious, and I mean really serious, about the you in trust, uniting with people who will help you focus on God. You need more worship in your life. You need more fellowship in your life. You need a small group in your life. You need to be more faithful in your attendance at worship because that's where you're going to get the wisdom and the strength and the encouragement that you need. Say, God, I haven't been faithful to you in worship. I haven't been faithful in fellowship. But I want to be, I want to unite with others. If you're not a member of Saddleback Church, we invite you to join us. Sign up for the class, next class 101, which is discovering my place in the body of Christ, in the family of God, discovering my role. We welcome you to join the membership of this church. Now the S in trust is surrender. Say in your prayer, dear God, I surrender my future to you. I surrender my future to you. I don't know what it is, but I surrender. I'm not going to worry about it. And finally, the last T is trust. Say, Jesus, I'm going to trust you with every detail of my comeback. I trust Jesus for my comeback. I trust Jesus for my future. I trust Jesus to get me out of this mess. I'm giving every area of my life to you. Father, you hear these prayers. And I ask you to bless them and give them a sense that you have heard the prayers as they begin the next step to their comeback. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, look up here a minute, and let's congratulate everybody who just prayed that prayer, some of them for the very first time. Congratulations to you. God bless you. You need to tell me about it so I can pray with you and for you. Take out a card. And, and on this, I prayed that prayer or checked the box. I gave my life to Christ, recommitting my life to Christ, whatever decision you're, is, you're, you're making. If you want to get baptized next weekend, just write the word baptism. If you haven't been baptized, that's your next step. Okay, maybe you put it off for years and years and years. Write baptism on there. That's one of the steps to your comeback. All right? And then if you're interested in saying, I want to use my job, for the kingdom of God. I want for, for Jesus' benefit. Uh, I, I want to use that my platform. I'm even interested in considering, would God call me into full-time Christian service? Then I want you to write either number one or number two on your card like last week. Number one, I'm interested in considering full-time Christian service. You write a number one. I'm interested in learning how to use my career, my business for Jesus Christ you write a number two, and I'll send you an invitation to that special meeting with me that's going to come up on August 16th, Thursday night. God bless you, everybody. We're going to give our offerings now. Finish filling out your cards and drop them in the basket so we can stay in touch with you. I depend on you writing to me every week to, to keep in touch with you. It's my way to communicate with you. God bless you. We'll see you next week in part three of Turning Setbacks into Comebacks. Thanks for checking out this message on YouTube. My name is Jay and I'm Saddleback's online campus pastor and I would love to invite you to join our online community. Here are three ways you can take a next step. First, learn more about belonging to our church family by completing Class 101 online. Second, don't do life alone anymore by getting into an online only small group that meets on platforms like Skype or learn more about hosting a group with your friends in your home. Third, join our global Facebook community to connect with others with the online community and be more engaged in the day-to-day. 
To take any of those next steps, visit saddleback.com online or email online at saddleback.com. Hope to hear from you soon.